please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. You didn't leave us blind. You didn't leave us without your truth. You have revealed yourself to us and revealed to us your truth uh, through your word. Your word is all-sufficient, inerrant, and perfect because you are all-sufficient, inerrant, and perfect. And so help us. Help us as we hear your word to yield to it. Help us as we hear your word to understand it and rightly handle it. And let it not just be observed by us, interpreted by us, but help us also, Lord, to apply it, putting it into action in our everyday lives so that we're growing in Christ-likeness. For that is our goal, and that is why we pray and thank you and ask this in his precious name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14, we're going more into um, tongues and prophecy and public worship, um, practical stuff. This isn't suggestive. This is practical commands for God, from God, on how his church should operate. And so Paul has been going through, I think this will become, um, we're in the same exact context that we have been throughout 1 Corinthians. Nothing's changed. And so this will kind of explain itself, I think, as we go along. So let's do that. In verse 1 in 1 Corinthians 14, these are guiding principles. Pursue love. Remember we talked about how love is the most important thing. If, you, if you're not using your gifts and if you're not pursuing love of the Lord and love for his people, then anything else you're doing is empty. And so he reiterates this point. Pursue love. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul had been declaring that love is of the most preeminence in the 13th chapter. Love, 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 everything is empty without love. Action is empty without love. It's it's like a clanging cymbal. It's no good. It's just noise. And since love is the greatest, you want to pursue that. There's... Nothing, he also mentions here, desire spiritual gifts. And the reason he does that is because there was nothing wrong with the Corinthian Christians desiring spiritual gifts. And there's nothing wrong with you and I desiring spiritual gifts from the Lord today. The problem was they took a godly desire and turned it into a manly or a worldly pursuit. Instead of yielding to God and saying, God is the one who gifts the, gives the gifts and he's the one, it's for his glory and for the edification or building up the church, it's, well, I want that gift. Or this gift is better, I think, so therefore that's the one I want. And so it turns something that was good and they were turning it into something bad. But it's still good in its purest form, so he has to make sure that there's no confusion. It's still okay to desire spiritual gifts Because the Holy Spirit gives a spiritual gift or gifts to everyone of his, everyone that's his. Every believer has a spiritual gift or gifts, every single one. So it's good to desire that. But he's also making sure you understand, ah, don't forget, love is the greatest, pursue that. Okay, so he's making sure he sets the tone here. You you have to seek after love as preeminent And then the gifts you seek after, look, because I love God so much, I'm willing to yield and and accept with gratefulness and gratitude whatever gift or gifts he's given me and appreciate the gift or gifts he's given others because I love God and because I love the brothers and sisters in his church. So he's not precluding the use of gifts or the desire for gifts. He's just saying, don't seek after showy gifts. Don't seek after gifts for your own purposes or for your own will and desire. You want to yield to whatever gift God has bestowed to you, appreciate whatever gift God has bestowed to others, all because you love God and your brothers and sisters in Christ. All of this is to be used for service to the Lord and service to your brothers and sisters in Christ anyway. And when I say that, that kind of sets the tone, doesn't it? Of course it's not for me. Of course it's not about me. It's to serve the Lord and his people. He goes on to say, desire the gifts, but especially prophecy. Now, why would he say that? He says that because unlike tongues and some of the other gifts that people were clamoring for, this gift 
always will edify the entire church. This gift will always have an edifying or a building up of the church, always. So in the Corinthian church, there was an overemphasis on tongues and an underemphasis on prophecy. And he's going to tell us a lot more about prophecy in this chapter. But before we go on, he's also going to talk about tongues. So I want to set the tone here and let you know something about what Paul's about to do here in the upcoming verses when it comes to tongues. He's going to have a difference between the singular use of the word tongue and the plural use of the word tongues. And so you got to have your, your head on a swivel to, to, and be watching for when he uses which because there will be times where that comes in handy. He will be using the singular to be able to distinguish fake tongues. The singular he will use many times to distinguish the fake tongues, uh, pagan tongues, gibberish, onomatopoeia, bing, bat, boom, zap, zoop, bop, beep. Singular. He does that because, look, there's only gibberish is gibberish, right? How many different types of gibberish is there? Well, there's one type of gibberish, so it's singular. And he'll be using the plural in some cases here to indicate the genuine tongues. And so that's helpful, that's useful. Because let me tell you, you can go into several different commentaries and find this handled quite differently. And so to have this kind of in your pocket before we proceed is very useful. Very, very useful. He's going to talk about how tongues are not as useful to the church as prophecy. They have a place, of course. But they're not as useful as prophecy. It has a purpose. And there's a way to use it. He's going to cover all those things in the upcoming verses. So let's see what we have here. Verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue, notice the singular, okay? For one, and if it's singular, it's speaking about false language, okay? Pagan gibberish. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Do not let that throw you. This throws so many people. You could render it this way, but to a God, not the God, okay? So see how important this is right, off the, right out of the gate? If you don't understand that it's talking about gibberish in this point and that it's talking about speaking to a God, not the God, you're going to read that and that's going to be your confirmation that tongues are for today and that me speaking in an in a individually heavenly kind of language is for today. And that is not what this is saying at all. One who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men. One who speaks gibberish speaks not to men, but to a God, for no one understands him. Right? Flip on uh, TBN, flip on several different shows, and you'll see people doing this, speaking in tongues, and they think that they are so spiritual. But no one understands them. No one understands them. He utters mysteries in the spirit. Boy, this is so easily twisted. He utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Pause. If we just read verses two and three, which of those two things, tongues or prophecy, sounds like it's getting a, 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 a thumbs up treatment? Prophecy. Which one sounds like it's greater in the mind of Paul here at this moment, in the context of what we're reading? On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Sounds positive, doesn't it? What about verse 2? He, for one who speaks in a tongue, again, you have to know that the individual um, use of that word tongue there is referring to gibberish, speaks not to men but to a God, for no one understands him. That sounds negative, doesn't it? So just keep all that in mind. So the one who speaks in a tongue is someone who is speaking gibberish. Verse 2 is talking about someone who is speaking gibberish and has no edification for the church and it does not glorify God. What are the things we've been talking about when regarding to spiritual gifts? It must glorify God and it must edify or build up the church and it must be done in love. So verse 2 is talking about someone who is speaking in gibberish. What's the purpose of language? Let me just ask you that question, okay? What's the purpose of language? Is the purpose of language to, true or false, the purpose of language is to communicate. 
True or false? True. You need a language. Why do you have language? So that you can communicate, right? What good is language if you cannot use it to communicate? What's the purpose of language? To communicate. The idea here is that someone who is speaking in gibberish like this is not using the gift the way that God intended in the time he intended it for, and they're speaking unknown things to an unknown God, an unknown spirit. You could put it that way. This is something that pagans do. This still happens today. You can Google Kundalini spirit and watch people from the eastern part of the world meandering in, in gibberish. They're not even speaking in their own language. They're yammering in gibberish. And what are they really doing? Well, they are talking to an unknown spirit, worshiping a pagan deity. There is no indication in Scripture anywhere, anywhere of anyone talking to God in anything other than human language. Let that sink in. Everything we do, we should have examples of, it, of in Scripture, right? Anything you're going to really plant a flag in, you want the authority of Scripture to back you up, don't you? So keep that in mind. Nowhere in Scripture is anyone ever recorded talking to God or God talking to them in anything other than a human language, a real, honest-to-goodness human language, not gibberish. Not gibberish. Jesus talks about this too in Matthew 6. Matthew 6 is where you find the Lord's Prayer. Matthew talks about, or he talks about this in Matthew too. Why do people, if people, if, this is, if what I'm saying is true, then why do people do it? Well, this might give you a little glimpse as to why. First off, you'd already know from the context of what we've talked about in 1 Corinthians that there were people in the Corinthian church who just wanted attention. It's a showy gift. All eyes on me. Here's, here's Jesus speaking in Matthew 6, starting in verse 2. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received a reward. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving might be done in secret. And your Father who sees you will, in secret will reward you. And when you pray, so see, he's saying, don't be like a hypocrite's. Don't be like those people who say that they're, they're Christians or at that time that they love God. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you pray, go into your room, shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and the father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, as the unbelievers, as the pagans do. Empty phrases has a couple different meanings. Empty phrases is what you think, right? I'm just gobbledygook, right? I'm just saying words, right? Um, salad, bowl, spoon, fork, table, chair. Are these words? Yes. Do they mean anything in the, in the combination of what I'm talking? Absolutely not, right? It's empty, it's empty words. It also has the connotation of onomatopoeia, bing, bang, zoom, zap, boop, bop, beep, right? Do not empty up, heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles or the unbelievers do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. And then he goes on to say, pray like this. And he gives the heavenly prayer, the outline of our Father in heaven. Holy is your name, right? That's what he goes on to do. Don't, don't be caught in speaking gibberish, thinking that you're being holy or spiritual. Empty phrases, empty words is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. No one understands those empty words and those empty phrases. This is just the flesh. This is just the flesh. Counterfeit speech meant to elicit um, some kind of ecstasy. And remember what we talked about at the very beginning of, of 1 Corinthians is that many of the people who were filling the Corinthian church came out of pagan practices where it was all about ecstasy or ecstatics. 
You want to get close to God? Run till you can't run anymore. And when you pass out because your legs are like rubber, you're going to kind of be a little in of it and a little out of it. And that moment, you're going to be closer to God than you were before, right? Dance till you can't dance no more. And then when you're ready to pass out, fast until you can't breathe. And then when you find or drink until you're so drunk that you have visions. Oh, that made you closer to God. We all know that's not the real way to get close to God. They would have orgies for the same reason. Does that sound godly? Of course not. That is not the way to get closer to God. It's just another ecstatic, another experience that they were seeking after and trying to use. They're dramatic. It's a dramatic display. It's something that, hey, it's showy. You're, it's going to get your eyes on me. And it's going to make me feel like, oh, I'm important. Oh, I'm close to God. But they're not speaking of God's Holy Spirit. They're speaking of some filthy spirit or from their own spirit. Not from the Spirit of God. They, they're speaking of some kind of mystery. And that's what he means by no one understands. In his spirit, he speaks mysteries. This isn't the mystery of the gospel that you've heard in other parts of Scripture. This is they speak mysteries, meaning these are untrue truths. <laughs> They're speaking mysteries. Not the truth. Not the truth of Scripture. Not the truth that the Holy Spirit comes to confirm and to teach. So you see the setup in verses 2 and 3. That kind of false tongues, useless. Bad. It's not even like it, where it's, oh, it's, not, it's, it's just kind of useless. It doesn't harm anything. No, obviously that's harmful, isn't it? Because we're talking about a different spirit. Instead, like in verse 3, on the other hand, prophecy Totally. So you have a con. Whenever you hear the phrase "on the other hand," right? It's setting up a contrast. So on the other hand, in comparison to these false tongues, on the other hand, you have genuine prophecy. Or better to understand it in your and my brain in our vernacular today is the the teaching and preaching of the truth. Because I don't want to confuse you and think that we're talking about the types of prophets who are filling Instagram and YouTube saying, the Lord gave me a vision today. The Lord saith this. The Lord saith that. And it's all gobbledygook and poppycock. The only, the only prophecy is the preaching and teaching of God's word, which has already been revealed to us and has been closed in Scripture. That's it. That's it. So on the other hand, the one who prophesies, the other one who preaches or teaches the truth, speaks to the people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Isn't that what happens when we preach and teach right out of God's word? That is exactly what happens. And that benefits everyone. It glorifies God and it edifies all of those he saved. Meets the mark, doesn't it, that we've talked about. Spiritual gifts are always for the glory of God and the building up of the church. It's never meant to be directed towards you, yourself. Edification is building up. It's a construction term to build up. The word of God being preached and teached will build someone up. It will encourage or exhort you think of, when you ever think of exhortation or you think of encouragement, you can think of like a coach in a locker room. All right, everybody, come on, let's do rally the team, perform your best, right? Encouraging. It will also comfort. Comfort in the sense, comfort has lots of different things that go along with it, right? Comfort can be to console someone, but it also is to strengthen them. And that's the way you need to look at this, is that when the word of God is prophesied, meaning that when it's preached and teached or taught, it is going to encourage, it's going to comfort, it's going to build up. It's going to lend comfort and strength. Verse 4. More contrast here. The one, and, and let me say this. It's so helpful to go slow through this, isn't it? If you read this quick... You're going to, you might miss it. You might miss it. Or you might improperly handle it or miss the context. Verse four, the one who speaks in a tongue, 
Okay, so guess what we're talking about? Real tongues, or are we talking about false gibberish? It's singular, so it's gibberish. The one who speaks in a tongue, gibberish, builds up himself. Now pause right there. Does that sound like it's part of what we said our litmus test is? Does it glorify God and does it build up the church? No, it says builds himself up. So it fails the test. The one who speaks in a tongue or gibberish builds up himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Do you see the contrast? One is negative, one is positive. There, there are so many commentaries and so many people who, who want to be able to preach and teach the use of modern day tongues today and this scripture, they go to it and they don't realize that they're using this scripture improperly. I am not some... I am not some savant, okay? Do you know how I know how to handle this rightly? I'm standing on the shoulders and the backs of many other godly men who have come before me who God revealed this truth to. And through study, you find that truth. And then in comparison to other truth in Scripture, you find that this is what lines up. And so then you know the truth from the truth. And so he's saying right here, because just imagine, if I didn't tell you about the, the plurals and the singular, just imagine. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. I can spin that to be like, he builds himself up. Oh, it's good for you. It's good for you. If I don't take the context of the rest of 1 Corinthians, you're going to think that's good, right? You can easily see how someone would make it sound that way. But when you take the context about, hey, what's good? It's why are the gifts? Why do we even have the gifts? To the glory of God and for the building up of the church. So that, if you know nothing else about the plural or the singular, that alone should be able to be something where you're like, wait a minute, it says builds himself up. That, odd. That's not how any of the rest of it has ha been handled in a positive light. That's weird. See? So the one who speaks in a tongue or in gibberish, false tongue, builds up himself. But, here comes the contrast, the one who prophesies, who preaches or teaches the truth, that's what that means. doesn't mean foretelling, oh, yeah, next week's lottery numbers are going to be, no, it's not that. It's not, oh, um, you're going to get a job on March 23rd, uh, 3024. So that's not prophecy that it's talking about here, not some new revelation. It's talking about the preaching and teaching of what has already been revealed. So that builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. Now, <laughs> just wait. I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. What? What is that talking about? What's going on there? Well, first, don't forget our little premise that we set up, right? Singular, plural, don't forget any of that. Prophecy can be understood by everybody. The preaching and teaching of God's revealed word can be understood by everybody. When he says, I wish all of you spoke in tongues, he's saying here is that, he's talking about the real gift. Notice it's plural. I wish all of you spoke in tongues, okay? But before you say, oh, there goes our theory. It's been blown up by this one verse, right? Remember this, um, does everybody have the same gift? Nope. We learned that in 1 Corinthians 12. So not everybody has the same gift. So is Paul going, is Paul forgetful? Was he carried along in the Holy Spirit expect, except in this part? Right, why would he say, I wish you all spoke in tongues? Again, plural, meaning genuine languages, gifted by God for the proclamation of his gospel and the building up of the foundation of his church. He's saying, I wish you all said, he, he's just saying, what? He doesn't really desire everybody to speak in the, in the true gift of tongues because that is contrary to what God already said. Not everybody gets the same gift. God gives it through his Holy Spirit as he wills and desires. So why would he say that? It's hypothetical. It's hypothetical. If you insist on going after such gifts as tongues, at least seek the one that's going to be better for the church. That's all he's saying. You know, watch for sarcasm 
in Scripture. Watch for hypotheticals, right? And it's such a clear hypothetical because Paul has already made it clear that not everyone gets the same gift. So obviously, if he says, I wish you all spoke in genuine languages, he doesn't really mean that. He must be using it as a literary device because he's already said, look, not all of you are going to have the same gifts. So that's what he's saying. If you really want gifts, if you really are going to clamor and just claw after gifts, make it a gift that's more useful, like prophesying. Preaching and teaching God's already revealed word because that benefits more people. It's more valuable to the church and more people are built up and edified by it. That's what he's saying. And then he kind of makes mention of, look, the, the only profit that tongues brings is if there's someone there who speaks that real language. Otherwise, it has no use, right? If we, if we confirm that tongues really is an actual language, if no one is there who speaks that language or who can supernaturally have been gifted by God to speak that language and interpret it, that real language, then it doesn't benefit anybody, does it? And that's what he's saying there. You should always, I want, and you should want, to go after that which is going to be of the greatest service to God and to his church. That's what Paul's saying. And between these two, prophecy is of greater service. Now, brothers, verse 6. If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you? Notice the plural. Okay? If I come to you speaking in tongues. He doesn't say, if I come to you speaking in a tongue. He says tongues. This is him referencing genuine language. If I come to you speaking in a genuine language, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? He's just saying, look, in my ministry, I want to speak as much as possible so that as many as possible will profit. This is not rocket science, right? If, if, if you say, Michael, there's a room full of people in here and they all speak English, I, I want you to go preach and teach to them. And I go, all right, I'm going to do it in French. What would, what would your reaction be? Uh, why? None of them speak French. You're not going to accomplish anything, right? Well, I, kinda, I, took, a, I took second, you know, second degree French and with Miss Masterson in 10th grade. I know a couple words. Who's going to benefit from that? Nobody. Paul is saying, in my ministry, I speak so as many as possible can profit. That's what that means. Even if I, an apostle, come to you and speak in a real language of tongues... It won't spiritually benefit any of you if you can't interpret it. Just ipso facto. This is, not, this is also something that can be used to blow up the idea of it's my private language. It's my private language. Pastor Michael, you just don't understand. When I speak what you think is gibberish is just my private prayer language. Well, okay, um, the problem with that is, is that that can't be. We're talking about why did God give the gifts for the benefit of his people to be edified and for his glory. It also can't be because it is a sign for unbelievers, which you'll see. That's going to be coming up here. You have to have a translator for it to have any meaning. What did you just read with me in verse 6? There's no benefit unless there's a translation. There's no benefit. Zero. It doesn't mean there's little. No means no. Zero means zilch. There's no benefit. And if you say, oh, it's my own private prayer line, how does it edify the church? It doesn't. It doesn't. Verse 7. Here's some examples that Paul gives. Even in, uh, if even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will any, anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, notice the singular, 
You, you, your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible. How will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. I, I don't understand the mass confusion with tongues, especially when we have clear scripture like this. I really don't understand it. So Paul is using an illustration here that, look, you all know instruments. You all know a harp. You all know a flute. Um, you all know what it's like to listen to somebody play a harp and play a flute and they play distinct notes that you can tell when strung together make a melody, right? Make a pleasant sound. You know the difference between that and a child who, you know, maybe it's your brother or sister's child and you give them a drum set or you give them a piano for their birthday and you laugh all the way to the basement when they open it up and what are they going to do? They're bang, 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 right? And what they're doing is making indistinct sound. And it's unpleasant to everyone but the child making the indistinct sound. Just bang, 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 bang. bang. There's no bang, bang on the piano. There's no, it, you can't understand the notes. It's unpleasant and it it's doesn't yield anything, does it? Same idea. You, you, you are speaking in an unintelligible language, an un, a fake language. It's gibberish. No matter how it makes you feel, it accomplishes nothing. If, if that's true of instruments, how much more so should it be when you're saying you're speaking for God? Do you see the point there? Do you see that illustration? Verse 10. And this is talking about how all languages can be understood if one knows the meaning. Verse 10. There are doubtless many different languages in the world. So pause. He's talking about, there's your evidence that he's talking about a genuine, honest-to-goodness language. He's referencing it. It's in context of with what you're talking about. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. Again, like I asked you earlier, what's the purpose of language? Communication. Every word has a meaning. I don't just walk up to somebody and say, blah, 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 blah. You don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. There's no purpose in it. It does no good. So doubtless, there's many different languages in the world. None are without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I'll be a foreigner to the speaker and a speaker the foreigner to me. A language is in its of itself a gift from God. You can communicate to other people because of language. And Paul is just, is, is just spouting the obvious here. The goal of language is to communicate, not confuse. It's to pass. That's why he's saying prophecy is much more useful because whenever you prophesy, you are definitely speaking to as many people as possible about God's revealed truth. This happened in Acts 2 when the apostles are given the gift of genuine tongues and they are speaking in languages that people within the great crowd in front of them heard their own language. Somebody is hearing their language because one of the apostles is speaking that language. Another person from a different region who speaks a different language is hearing their honest-to-goodness real language from another apostle who's speaking in that language. That's, that's what we're talking about, outlined in Acts 2. So the gift of tongues was never, ever meant to be turned into what it's become today. Useless gibberish. It's always been human language. Human language that someone else was able to hear and understand. Verse 12. So with yourselves. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. My mind is unproductive. Without an interpretation, the speaker does not benefit, neither does anyone else. That's what he's saying. If, you, if you're not speaking a genuine language and there's no one there who understands, you benefit nothing and so too everyone else around you. No one benefits. And he just gets done saying, strive to excel in the building up of the church. 
Strive for that. He's t- he, he, is, he is being a little sarcastic here. Strive for what builds up the church. What good are you if you're talking and you don't understand what you're saying and nobody else in that group does either? You're not accomplishing anything. It's foolishness. So, what's the result? What am I to do? Verse 15. What am I to do with all this? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? Somebody goes, you don't know what I just said. You're going to say amen? You don't know what I just said. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. Do you see the test? Is the church built up? Is God glorified? I thank God that I speak in tongues, the genuine gift, more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words with a tongue. What, what, What value is there in praying to God or praising God without any understanding? Zero. Zero. You can't say amen if you don't understand what's being said or sung or prayed. What am I to do? I pray with my spirit, but I pray with my mind also. Very important verse. It's not just feel it out. Turn off your brain. You're thinking too much. No, no, no. You pray with your spirit, but you pray with your mind also. You sing praise with your spirit, yes, but you sing with your mind also. Why are we so careful about what songs we sing and what the verses say? Because you sing with your spirit, but you sing with your mind also. We want both things to line up so that we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. You don't want to be ignorant. Paul says in verse 18, I speak in tongues more than you all. He's not, he's not saying genuine tongues is bad. He's saying it has its place, but you must make sure that there's interpretation there so that it builds up the church. This is simple. Simple. He, he could have used that gift more than anyone else. We don't know how often he used the genuine gift of tongues. We don't know. We do know how much he preached and taught, though, don't we? All the time. And that tells you which one he thought was more beneficial and edifying to the church. The teaching and preaching of God's revealed word, by far. Because that is what's highlighted in the ministry of Paul, by far. It's, if, if, if it was that important, I'm not joking, there are literally ministries and churches where the speaking of, of tongue is, is, is it. That is the core and the center of their whole being. And to them, I would say, when you read through the entire New Testament, doesn't it concern you that, that Paul, who speaks in tongues more than anyone, it's never really shown in Scripture? Certainly not highlighted like you think it would if that was what your church was all about. That should be concerning, Right? Just as concerning as it is, is where does it say in Scripture um, to follow your heart? Where where does it say that? It doesn't. So you should be weary. He says, I want to instruct others. Teaching others is most important. Not the speaking of gibberish. Wrapping up on what we're going to talk about today. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be, verse 20, be infants in evil. But in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, By people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign for believers, not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. Another contrast. 
If therefore the whole church comes together and all speaks in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, they will not say that, will they not say that you are out of your minds? Have you ever gone into it? Have you ever had anybody invite you to their church and you walk in and it's a bunch of hoo ha and it's all that stuff going on? You're going to walk in, you're going to say, these people are out of their minds. Paul has the same reaction here, right? Will you not say these people are out of their minds? But if all prophesy, if all are teaching and preaching the revealed word of God and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. Which sounds better? Which sounds more edifying? And he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What, what is the difference there? Prophesying again is preaching and teaching the revealed word of God. What effect did it have on this outsider who came into the church? They hear the word of God that's been revealed in scripture, being preached and taught. And what's the, what's the reaction? The, he, he's called to account by the word of God. The secrets of his heart are laid bare before the Lord. And falling on his face, that's repentance. That's con a contrite heart that desires to be made right with God and in humility realizes its sinfulness, falls on its face, and worships God in repentance, declaring that God really is among you. Wow. What would you rather have? Somebody come into your church and go, uh, they hear all these different people talking in indistinguishable language, and they go, uh, you guys are crazy. Would you rather have that? Or would you rather have somebody come into your church, hear the word of God, and hear the word of God being talked about, taught, and preached by everybody. And they have a repentant, contrite response and humility to it, falling on their face, worshiping and praising God. Which one would you rather have happen? Do you see the contrast? This is not even close. It's not even close. It's a, it's a shameful reality to people who make the speaking of false languages their priority and their calling card in so-called church. This rightly handled scripture should just blow all that out of the water. Some people don't realize that when they're doing that, that they're really showing that they, they have no care for scripture. That no one among them ever took the time to read one of the most pressing pieces of scripture in regards to the context of tongues. No, no one there ever read it and said, you know what, I've got a question. You know what, I feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe we're not doing this right. No one has ever done that. I mean, that's very telling, isn't it? It's very exposing to what's really going on and what the real purpose is. It's not for the glory of God and it's not for the edification of the building of the people because that's not what they're interested in. Not all believers have been given the gift of speaking in tongues, genuine, real language. It is not something that is for today, it's no longer needed. It was needed at a very specific time and place within church history. And you see that mentioned, and then you see it drifting away as its need drifted away. It was for the foundation of the church, and a building only needs one foundation. When that building is finished, or when that foundation is finished, you move on, and you build upon it. Same idea here. So Paul is really taking people who think that tongues is a superior gift, because that was one of the problems in the Corinthian church, that they think tongues is a superior gift, and he's saying, no, 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 no. Love is most important of all, and if you really want to desire a gift, desire a gift that's going to do the most good in glorifying God and building up the church. And what is that? What's better than tongues? Prophecy, preaching and teaching the word of God. And the examples that he just gave is powerful. Powerful. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. Look, you don't even know that person, right? This is, just, this is just something that Paul's talking about. But can you, you, were you imagining with me somebody doing that? Coming into church and they're hearing God's word preached and taught and they're convicted by it and then they are called to account by God in their heart? The secrets of his heart are disclosed and laid bare before him and he falls on his face and worships God. Doesn't that stir you? Yeah. That excites me as a believer. He doesn't want the real gift to be corrupted. 
So he gives the principles and the, and the direction on how that gift should really be used when it's really in action. And then also making sure all the while you understand that, look, no matter what gift you've given, it's got to be done out of love for God and love for your brother and sister in the Lord. And there are some gifts that, and, and whatever is going to be the most useful, the most edifying. We'll stop there for today and we'll, we'll go back over this again and finish up chapter 14 next time. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, help us to mature in our understanding of your word. Help us not to be led by feeling or emotion, which are subjective, but instead, Lord, to be led by your objective, unchanging, unyielding word. For it is all sufficient for us to be able to live lives that are pleasing to you. And uh, you have given us everything that we need in your word to be able to do that. Help us. We want to, as individuals, honor you, love you, serve you with the gift or gifts that you've given us. We want to edify your, our brothers and sisters in Christ who you have put us around. And we want to do this all out of love for you and for them. Now help us to rightly live and to rightly handle things like this within church and within our own personal lives. Please continue to teach us your statutes and help us to walk in your ways for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.